Welcome back, everyone. We have an exciting episode to get into today. We have some major news. This started off as a writer strike, writers of different shows that help help write the scripts and late night shows and all that type of stuff. They decided to go on strike for different reasons. And that was that was pretty big. That's an important piece of news when writers are striking. That's happened before, but now it's been escalated. Actors have joined the strike. The Screen Actors Guild has joined the writer strike and shutting down Hollywood. And that is no understatement. Hollywood is going to literally be shut down with this. We have their big plans. They want to reshape the industry. So naturally, someone who's invested in these type of companies, I have an investment in Netflix, it raises the question, how does this impact Netflix? How does it impact Disney or Paramount or Comcast or Warner Brothers Discovery? All of these companies rely on producing content. So in this episode, we'll be looking at how this writers and now actors strike is impacting the industry and specifically what they're asking for. Some of their requests are a little crazy. So we'll be going into that as well. Now, we also have some other breaking news here. We have Lena Khan, the chair of the FTC, appealing the decision that the judge made that Microsoft beat the FTC and that the FTC under Lena Khan did not have a good argument for blocking that merger. She's appealing it. And now she's going before Congress where she's getting grilled. So we're going to be highlighting some clips from this congressional meeting of congressional members talking to Lena Khan. We have news of IPOs. Liquid Death, which is a company that makes beverages that look like they're scary, unhealthy energy drinks, but ironically, it's just mountain spring water or uh, healthy type of drinks. That company is now IPOing in 2024. So it started off as a bit of an ironic joke, a little marketing play. Now it's actually IPOing next year. This is a funny story. I, it has some broader implications I want to go over as well. And we have more official stats from Amazon on Prime Day, that big shopping event. So we'll be looking at that as well. So as always, we have a lot to get into. Let's go ahead and just start right off. And as always, we like to start off with a portfolio update. Now, this is the story fund. It's one of my two portfolios, and I give the warning frequently to not copy this portfolio. I would not try to replicate it because I think it's it's very concentrated. It's more volatile. It doesn't fit the needs of most investors. My attempt here is to build a portfolio of very high quality tech-based, highly scalable companies that have a ton of operating leverage to build pretty big positions in them and see if I can outperform the market that way. Now, this isn't my only strategy. I have another portfolio called the Passive Income Account I track on a different channel. That's a much larger portfolio. It's been performing better. But this is one that I still feel strongly will do well. I think it's gonna do well, but it has a lot of volatility in the mix. The biggest companies that I'm concentrated in right now is Amazon, Netflix, and Google. We have a little bit of Microsoft and Adobe. And then after that, we have some smaller holdings now, Salesforce, Apple, Crocs, and PoolCorp. So the big three are Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And these three, if they do really well, the portfolio is gonna do really well. If these businesses perform, if their operating metrics increase, if their cash flows climb and their earnings climb, this portfolio is gonna do really well. If they don't, the portfolio won't do well. So I've tied the performance to these three companies. My opinion is I think they'll all do really well. I'm very bullish on all of them. That's why I have so much capital tied into them. Now, this portfolio's performance against the S&P 500 is mapped out here. This is as fair as possible. I track it where I created an alternative reality. If I had put the same money at the same amount in the S&P 500, this is what it would look like. So this tracks every single deposit that I've made into the portfolio. As you can see, for a time period, all through 2022, 2021, I was underperforming big time. The gap in performance here was in some cases up to 30%, 30% under the S&P 500. And then it started to narrow the gap right around here, basically the beginning of the year when the market started to recover. At this point in time, I was down 25% below the S&P 500. That was the delta between the two. And now it's gone up to around 7% between the two portfolios. So from 25% to 7%. We're closing the gap every single day. And today's another day where we've closed the gap another percent. So that's the storyline. Now, a lot of people might look at this and they might think, wow, that's crazy that this portfolio recovered this quickly. How did it, how did it go back that fast? 
That's what happens when you have 51% returns year to date. So it's obviously had remarkable returns year to date, $54,000, and that is the big recovery. So we're back in the green, albeit by a little bit. The job's not done. We still have to catch up to the S&P 500 and then start to outperform it. The companies that could do that are Netflix, Google, and Amazon. Depending on their earnings reports and if things are going well, if they do well, we should surpass the S&P 500. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. I think that these companies are going to do great, but it is a bit more high risk. Netflix is the soonest earnings report. If I look at Netflix right here, we have an earnings report coming up on the 19th. So that's going to be a big day. I'm very hopeful that it will do well, but Netflix is crazy. So we'll see what direction it goes. Now let's go ahead and move on to the big news of the day. The actors are joining the writers in striking Hollywood over a lot of different reasons. Now we'll go over the different reasons in a minute, but this is an elevation of something that's already extremely disruptive. It's disruptive to have writers striking in the first place because obviously writers write all the content, all the scripts, all the nightly shows, all the jokes that Hollywood then acts out and produces and edits and does everything else for. So writers are basically the starting point. But when it's just writers, there's at least some leeway because if you already have a full script, then you can at least film that script or the parts that you have already written out without any script changes. You have some things that you can do. At least you can work with the actors. But now we have actors joining in. Any actor that's part of the Screen Actors Guild, which is most of the main actors, most big stars are part of this, they are joining in the strike. Now to set the stage even further of how big this is, I just wanna read a part here. They say, on July 13th, led by President Fran Drescher, called the union's first strike against the film and television companies in 43 years. Combined with Hollywood's writers' ongoing strike, the work stoppage applying to 160,000 members, from actors to singers to dancers, marks the first simultaneous strike by two unions since 1960, and a sign of an industry in tumult. That is the setup right now. Two huge unions that basically are the heart of all of production, all of Hollywood production, are both striking at the same time. And this hasn't happened since the 1960s. And let me remind you, that these companies like Disney, they're not having a good time already. They're, they're not, it's not like they have had cash flows just going to the sky. That's not the situation these companies are in. The free cash flow, the profitability of companies like Disney are at an all time low right now. They're at lows that they've been at back in 1990s. They have the same problem with Paramount. These companies aren't doing amazing. They're struggling right now. Warner Brothers Discovery, same situation. They're trying to do this big transition and they're not making a ton of money in the process. So this rider strike is not only devastating by the nature and size of it, but it's also incredibly inopportune for the companies that they're striking. Now, of course, the actors and writers aren't going into Qualtrim and looking over the financials and going, wow, these companies aren't doing too well right now. They don't have that much free cash flow. They don't have that much earnings right now. They're not making judgment calls based on that. They just believe that these companies are really big. Disney's big, Comcast is big, Netflix is big, and they want more of the pie. They feel like it's very unfair the way things are divided right now. They say, quote, we are victims here. We are being victimized by a very greedy entity. So that's the, the leader of the organization telling them that they're victims and that they deserve a lot more. They also mention in this, one of the things that's repeated frequently is they seem incredibly, incredibly threatened by AI. Quote, an AI proposal which protects performers' digital likeness. They mention AI there once, and then they go on to talk about AI again, saying, if we don't stand tall now, we are all going to be in trouble. We are all going to be in jeopardy of being replaced by machines. So they think that this is it's going to be devastating to them if they don't make these agreements. But right here, I think this sentence is ridiculous. That if they don't somehow negotiate a deal, they're going to be replaced by robots. Let me just say this right away. If your job can be replaced by robots, it's going to be replaced by robots. No amount of deal making or lobbying can protect you from robots. That is inevitable. But it's also ridiculous to believe that every writer and every actor is going to be replaced by machines. I think that that is an incredibly ridiculous statement. ChatGPT is cool. It can make up a couple paragraphs and put together some funny stories, but it's not going to replace 
writers that write big, long story arcs for multi-seasons that need things to make sense on multi-dimensional levels to have 3D character development. It's just not going to get to that point, and it's certainly not there now. And then suggesting that actors will be replaced by machines, I think is even more ridiculous. The amount of effort and time it would take to do face facial swapping and that type of thing would be far more laborious and intensive than just hiring an actor. Now this might just be a strategy to kind of excite the people here and make them feel more energized because now they have a big bad boogeyman, a big bad threat, which is the machines. But I don't see this as a credible threat to their job at all. And again, even if it was, they're not going to stop it. That is the nature of the game. This is like engineers and software developers yelling at Microsoft to stop making coding applications, to stop making new ways of optimizing and automating things. It's just not going to happen. Automation will continually trudge along throughout time, and you have to keep ahead of it. Now, this continues on with how bad things are escalating right now. They're getting out of control. After talks fell apart, union leaders described negotiations as combative and emphasized that the AMPTP the AMPTP is like a body of negotiators for all the companies, has, quote, refused to meaningfully engage on some topics and on others completely stonewalled us. So they don't feel like they're getting anywhere. They're too far apart. And this is something that Bob Iger, just in an interview yesterday, described as well. He said that what these unions are asking for is way too far-fetched. It's ridiculous what they're asking for. That was his take on it. But they don't believe that. They think they're getting stonewalled and not listened to. The AMPTP said it offered pay and residual increases, higher caps on pension and health contributions, audition protections, shortened series options, and AI protections. Drescher called the proposal insulting and disrespectful of our massive contribution to the industry. And so after weeks of negotiation, the actors began assembling plans for picketing. So we have the battle going on right now. The AMPTP is saying, look, we're negotiating in good faith. We've offered you a bunch of different things across the across the entire landscape of your employment, and you're just not being reasonable. The guilds are saying that you're stonewalling us, you're not taking us seriously, and the offers so far are way too low. So they're just so far apart. And this is where you get into a prolonged strike, where they stubbornly disagree, they can't meet somewhere in the middle. Now again, the problem here is a lot of people might be comparing this to the writer strike that we had five or six years ago. Remember that one? It shut things down. Uh, Hollywood produced some stuff, but it wasn't quite as much. This isn't really synonymous to that because this is also an actor strike, and that's so much different. They say that the immediate aftermath of the writer's work stoppage on the other hand, only ensnared late night shows, which rely on daily writing from scribes and news developments, news of several scripted production shutting down trickled in, starting with Netflix, Stranger Things, Apple TV's Loot, Marvel's Blade. So there's already shows shutting down production because of the writer strike, but now they say this time with performers walking off the job, the ripple effects and the shutdowns are going to be dramatically different than just a writer's strike. So that's where we are right now. The writers and actors have a major disagreement with the company and we're at a standstill. Hollywood is shut down. This is gonna be a huge impact to the entire industry if this continues. And what I wanna do is go over how this is going to impact the industry from Netflix to Warner Bros. Discovery, Paramount and Disney. The first thing that I'll say in terms of the stocks is this will actually improve the financials in the short term. You can take Netflix as an example here. We can look at Netflix in 2020. In 2020, it had a huge spike in free cash flow. That seems like good news when a company grows its free cash flow, right? I always track free cash flow as a major metric. But in this case, it wasn't really such good news. The company was not expecting to have $2 billion in free cash flow. They didn't plan on it. They didn't anticipate it. They didn't even want $2 billion in free cash flow. In the prior year, they had minus $3 billion. So why did the cash flow jump so suddenly from the negative to the positive? Well, what happened in 2020? We had the COVID lockdowns, the restrictions. They couldn't film or produce content for at least three months. That means that they couldn't spend money on production. When they couldn't spend money on production, they had more money sitting around because they still had their subscribers. That led to an influx of cash, which is where you get the free cash flow. So this is the short-term impact of a writer's or a strike of any kind in the business. It'll actually increase the short-term financial metrics. It'll make the free cash flows go up more than expected. 
So when we look at this and we compare it to Warner Brothers Discovery or any of these companies, you're going to see the same thing. If the rider strike goes on for three months, you can expect a big jump in free cash flow from every one of these companies. Now, it's tempting to get excited about that as an investor because free cash flow typically means good. In this situation, it's not good. The core business model of these companies is reliant on creating and producing content on a continual basis so that they can retain subscribers. If you stop creating content, you'll see higher rates of churn, more people leaving every month, because the content library of the platforms becomes stale. So the first impact that this will have is artificially boosting the short-term financials of the company. But it's short-sighted to believe that that is a positive thing, because a second level impact is where the content goes from here. If you can't write content and you can't have professional actors acting out content, what do you do? Well, if you're Netflix, you say, yeah, all those reality TV shows that you're bringing up, let's just produce all of them because we have a ton of money sitting around, not doing anything. People need something new to watch. Reality TV doesn't require professional actors and it doesn't require writers. It just requires getting crazy people on the show that are entertaining to look at. So you have an influx of reality TV shows as a consequence of this. And then I think even a third level effect, I'd say a winner if this goes on long term, is Google with YouTube. YouTubers, in most cases, don't have a lot of writers. They don't have professional actors. They're used to producing content day in and day out without a production team. So this is just business as usual for YouTubers. There's nobody in the Screen Actors Guild or anything like that for most YouTubers. So a lot of people might become moving over to YouTube to see fresh content if they're not getting it in Hollywood. Now, in terms of the specific positioning of these different companies, we have the notes here that this is hurting Walt Disney. This is the reason the company's down today. It's hurting Warner Brothers Discovery a lot. And I think the market here is assessing it correctly that it's not hurting Netflix quite as much. That is because Netflix has by far the biggest pipeline of content already created. They create their content on a three-year arc, so they already have well over one year of content. Meaning that in terms of the consumer, in terms of the viewer, they should notice no difference in content release schedule for at least a year. So that's the consequences of this. Ultimately, I don't think it's good for anyone. I don't think it's good for the entire industry, but out of the companies, I think that Netflix is the least impacted by this. And I'd say the biggest winner is probably Google. Now let's go ahead and move on to an exchange here. And this is just, just a remarkable exchange. If you haven't heard, Lena Khan recently appealed the decision of the judge that Microsoft could now complete the merger. So here's an exchange going on between her track record of failure and losing all of these cases and what Congress is saying about it. Determinations. But, but about are you bringing cases repeal? that you expect to lose? Could you repeat? Are that? you bringing cases that you expect to lose? Absolutely not. Okay. Well, your track record seems to suggest otherwise. Let's. That's such a, a big burn there. They're actually asking her if she's bringing cases that they're expecting to lose because the track record is so bad. Look more closely at the Activision decision, though. Uh, the court first noted that in an attempt to lower your burden, you essentially made up case law. You couldn't find anything uh, actually that the courts have provided in terms of precedent. So you cited to your own FTC decision uh, as precedent. But irrespective of the legal standard, uh, the court, you probably wouldn't have won under any standard because the court said this, that the FTC has not raised serious questions regarding whether the pro proposed merger is likely to substantially lessen competition. Not raised serious questions. The court also rejected your assert not only rejected your assertion of a likely anti-competitive effect, but found just the op opposite, that the record evidence points to more consumer access. So why should Americans have faith in your judgment when this Biden-appointed judge says you are so far off the mark? Congressman, this matter is still pending before the FTC in administrative adjudication, so I'm just going to be limited in what I can say about the merits. Uh, our complaint lays out uh, the staff's view of the, what this merger would result in and why that would be a law violation. Uh, you but the judge reports. roundly rejected it and said there weren't even serious questions, and now having lost, you're spending even more taxpayer money on an appeal that you're even less likely to win because the appeals court is going to defer to the trial court's findings of fact in this very fact-intensive matter. So why are you spending even more taxpayer resources pursuing this appeal? So I can say again, this was a you know, staff recommendation. I can say it a general matter. Uh, staff always looks closely at an opinion and looks at whether 
there are certain errors in law that they believe are worth appealing on. Those are, in general, the types of determinations that go into whether the FTC ends up appealing. Okay, so that's the type of exchanges happening right now. I don't think things are going well for Lena Khan. And the reputational damage here of losing case after case, I do think makes it more likely for other mergers, companies like Amazon, to have their cases looked at with more scrutiny when the FTC brings up complaints. Now, moving on, we have some news here of a new IPO. You are going to be able to invest in the company Liquid Death in 2024. Liquid Death is a company that you see their cans now in lots of different grocery stores. I've actually seen them around. They must be selling a lot of them because you're buying canned water, mountain water, and it's designed to be ironic and look like Monster Energy, which is supposed to be unhealthy, but this is really a healthier take. So there's that little comedic factor to it. I don't know how good the long-term business structure is or how good this will sell or if it's just a bit of a, a gag or a trend, but either way, they're actually IPOing in 2024. Now, the reason I highlight this is not only is it a bit of funny news, but it shows that the stock market is going up. This is a type of thing that happens when stocks are higher, prices are higher, people are feeling good about things, they're making gains, and there's liquidity in the stock market. That's when they typically try to target their IPOs. So aiming for 2024, they're showing interest right now. I think they're gonna only IPO this company if the stock market remains up, if there's ample liquidity. And a lot of people believe that this type of event, when you see more and more silly IPOs, more and more companies like this coming out and, and trying to get liquidity and trying to have their big payday, that means that you should be a little bit more cautious. That's the type of thing that was happening back in 2021. Now, the last bit of news I wanna go over is the Prime Day event. We have some official stats here. So these aren't estimates, these are the stats from Amazon. They first highlight something here that I think is politically motivated. They say the Prime Day 2023 was the biggest Prime Day event for independent sellers whose sales grew faster than Amazon store outpaced Amazon's retail business. So they're saying that independent sellers, third party, outpace the growth of Amazon's own business, the first party, which is both good for the sellers. It's good for the optics. It's good for the politics to have smaller sellers on your company doing really well. But it's also good for Amazon because remember, third party has higher margins. Amazon just charges fees and then they they realize those fees as revenue. So they actually have a lot higher margins on the third party sellers than they do their own store. Now they highlight some of the stats here and they're pretty remarkable. The number of purchased items was 375 million worldwide and people saved more than 2.5 billion on millions of deals across Amazon store. So 375 million items is well above analyst estimates. They were believing it was gonna be somewhere around 350 million. So 25 million more items sold on the first day. That's very good news for Amazon. This actually showed that a lot of people predicting the economic slowdown and consumer confidence going down and people not wanting to do things like this, they were wrong yet again. Amazon increased the amount of sales year over year and items by a pretty big extent. Now, they also go on to highlight some of the top selling categories and products here, saying that home, fashion, and beauty were among the top selling deal categories. And the Fire TV, the Laneige Lip Glowy Balm, Apple AirPods, and the Bizzle Little Green Portable Deep Cleaner are among the top selling deals. I actually think that my wife bought this Bizzle Little Green Portable Deep Cleaner. I think that's what we got. If you have kids, you need something like that. So that's the top categories. All in all, I am not concerned about Amazon. A lot of people have been very concerned about the CapEx and the investments they're making, but I still believe the company is headed in the right direction fundamentally. You can argue about the valuation, but I think the ads business is doing great. The retail business, the prime subscription, the member activity is obviously doing well, better than last year. Then of course you have AWS, a big slowdown in it. It's scary, but it's so big, it's gonna have some cyclicality in that business. So this is just a little bit more evidence, some real data points that makes me feel good about owning Amazon. I have no concerns about it currently. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Enjoy your weekend.